Let's get started. So a, a, a very warm welcome to all of you who've joined us for the Feminist Research Speaker Series first event of the year. I want to begin by acknowledging the lands on which we're gathered. For most of us, we're situated on Treaty 6 territory. The lands of Treaty 6 are a gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples. I urge, use of, I urge those of you who are joining us from other locations to reflect on and acknowledge the histories, languages, and cultures that influence our communities. So again, welcome. My name is Michelle Marr, and I am the chair of the Department of Women's and Gender Studies here at the University of Alberta. Today is the first event of the 2020-2021 Feminist Research Speaker Series, which is organized jointly between the Department of Women's and Gender Studies and the Intersections of Gender which is one of five signature areas of research and teaching at the University of Alberta. We've got a great title today and a great topic. So the title uh, of, of today's presentation is Drag Queen Miss Chief Eagle Test Tickle Indigenizes and Queers the Archive and the Repertoire. And our talk today is presented by Jean O'Hara. Dr. O'Hara is an assistant professor in the Department of Drama at the University of Alberta. She's been directing and teaching theater for the past 18 years, and her research interests include the intersectionality of race, class, gender, disability, and sexuality in performance art and theater, including Augusta Bauer's Theater of the Oppressed. 
O'Hara's work also foc focuses on Indigenous theater and representation. She's worked in partnership with Indigenous communities for the past 15 years, including exciting collaborations with Native Earth, Earth Performing Arts Center for Indigenous Theater and Spider Woman Theater. She's author of Two Spirit Acts, Indigenous Queer Performances. Her other publications include The Journey Home in Salmon is Everything Community. Dr. O'Hara will be collaborating today with Jake Cardinal, who is a University of Alberta student, playwright, journalist, and award-winning author from Saddle Lake Cree Nation, Treaty 6 territory. I'm thrilled to have you both here. Um, after their presentation, Dr. Selena Couture will move us into a, uh, into a discussion. She'll start us off with some provocations and some questions, and we will have a Q&A. So right now, the chat function in this webinar is closed, but we'll, we will have lots of opportunity for um, conversation. So Dr. Couture is a settler scholar and an assistant professor in the drama department at the U of A in Edmonton. Uh, Treaty 6 Territory and Métis Region Number 4. Her research practice responds to the growing crisis of global warming and develops a wider collaborative network and expands efforts to create responsible relations with Indigenous people, lands, and all other than human beings. She's the author of, most recently, Against the Current and Into the Light, Performing History and Land in Coast Salish Territories and Vancouver's Stanley Park. That was published by Miguel Queen's Press. And she's also author of On This, On this Patch of Grass, City Parks and Occupied Lands, which is published by Fernwood 2018. So I'm just gonna turn things over to Dr. O'Hara. Thank you, thanks everyone for being here. I'm really excited to share what I've been thinking about and writing about and so forth. Um, I just want to first honor um, the passing of Two-Spirit playwright and poet Daniel David Moses from the Delaware Nation and the, Tusk the Tuscaron Nation Bear Clan. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet him and see the production of his play Almighty Voice and his wife. So I just want to honor that we lost someone pretty amazing. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that I grew up on Narragansett land and I spent most of the majority of my adult life on Wiat land. And I want to name um, that the Wiat have sustained uh, many forms of genocide with the invasion of European men searching for gold. And on February 26, 1860, during a seven day world renewal ceremony on Tulawa Island, Wiat people were massacred in three, separation, three separate locations. Few survived and the murderers were acquitted. Today, the Wiat people have reclaimed Tuloa Island and have continued their world, world renewal ceremonies and have brought back other, ceremon other ceremonies. They're also active in working to teach the younger generation their language, knowledge, and, tradi and traditions. Um, and I've also worked closely with the Yurok, Kuruk, and Hupa doing um, theater storytelling, and that radically changed my worldview. Um, so I just want to give a quick brief thing about Kent Monkman. Um, he is a two-spirit Cree interdisciplinary visual artist. He is a member of the Fisher River Cree Nation in Treaty 5 territory, and he lives and works in Dish with One Spoon territory. Um, I also wanted to show a short clip from Monkman just talking about his work. It's a really uh, short one, and uh, Michelle's going to have that coming up now. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this. Chief Eagle Testicle is an alter ego that I created to live inside my work to challenge uh, received ideas about art history. I created this installation based on a painting by Fragonard. In that painting, a woman is being wooed by two suitors. 
So I decided to have Miss Chief here representing the indigenous person being kind of wooed between the French and the English uh, during the fur trade. In this painting of the Fathers of Confederation, which I call the Daddies, I sat Miss Chief on a little stool in the front of the composition as a way to insert an indigenous point of view or an indigenous perspective into this meeting where Canada was carved up into the provinces. There are nine chapters in the Shame and Prejudice exhibition. This chapter is on residential schools. So I decided to paint a scene that depicted the removal of children. So this scene has a, a certain violence to it. It's, uh, it's a difficult painting. The intent of this project was really to ask my audience to think differently about the history of Canada. And I wanted the last 150 years of this country to be seen through the lens of Indigenous experience. Great. Um, I also just wanted to give a short definition um, for those of you who don't know uh, for Two Spirit. It's actually a word that was created in 1990 um, by a group of Indigenous LGBT community members who gathered in San Francisco to address their turns, uh, address their concerns versus the dominant white gay community whose, whose agenda at that time was um, our beginning in that marriage equality, that kind of um, focus. So a quicker definition is indigenous people who live outside the colonial gender binary and the heteropatriarchal sexuality. Um, so moving from there, I'm gonna just, uh, Go to my research paper, it's a shortened version. Um, bear with me, I'm, I'm more of a director than an actor and I'm more gonna be reading than, uh, than performing. So here we go. Um, Kent, Mon Kent Monkman indigenized and queers the archive through his paintings, films, and the installations while exposing the colonial imperialist project through his drag persona, Mischief Eagle Testicle. Monkman, quote, dares to imagine a history through the lens of his own gaze, a sharp perspective gaze, and unravels the complex stories of our heritage of our times. Greg Hill summarizes Monkman's artwork as a, quote, on ongoing critique that interrogates the Christian righteousness of colonial expansion, the sexual overtones of religio religious subjugation, and the media manipulation of images of indigenous people used to facilitate and maintain imbalance of, the, of these power dynamics. For the purpose of this research paper, I will examine Monkman's drag performance piece, Seance, which deconstructs and interrogates the distorted archive created by painter Paul Kane. George Catlin, and Ushan Delacroix. All three painters created a dominant white supremacist na narrative where all indigenous lands were supposedly uninhabited and the indigenous people on the land were depicted as noble or savage and ultimately becoming, quote unquote, a vanishing race. At the same time, each painter also depicted themselves along with other white people as, quote, superior and civilized. Carrie Swanson adds, Quote, there, they created a mythology that casts native people of the period and therefore those who follow as either brutal animalistic warriors or sad victims of Darwinian destiny. It is through the rep repertoire that Monkman creates a performance as an act of resistance against racist notions of indigenous people and the misrepresentation of two-spirit people. Seance was performed in the lobby of the Royal Ontario Museum, which is in now what's called Toronto, also called the ROM, as a direct response to his censorship from the First People's Gallery in the ROM. The First People's Gallery houses multiple colonial interpretations of indigenous people, including the painter Edmund Morris, a collection that David McIntosh describes as a, quote, tra tragic archive embedded in the thick layer of institutional simula simulations of the past. In fact, Morris was commissioned by Duncan Campbell Scott, head of the Department of Indian Affairs, whose mission was to, quote, to get rid of the Indian problem, to continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that has not been absorbed into the body politic, end quote. The Ram originally commissioned Monkman to create a painting for the show titled Shapeshifters, 
storytellers, time tellers, he proposed to paint a two-spirit version of one of Paul Kane's paintings that currently hangs in the First People's Gallery. The initial idea was to hang Monkman's work alongside Kane's work. According to Monkman, he was not allowed to have his work displayed in the First People's Gallery, and he was not allowed to challenge Kane's work. In an interview with the scholar after the seance performance, Ms. Chief responds to the censorship. One of the things that still shocks me is how these 19th century artists are still canonized in the museums as the voice of authority on Aboriginal cultures. We have the strength of our own voice to balance their per perception on our own cultures, yet these museums continue to resist dialogue about the work of my 19th century colleagues. It's been entrenched for so long. I still have so many European men to re-educate. Instead of a limited viewing of a proposed painting, Monkman created a public spectacle and it disrupts, and disrupts the one-sided colonial narrative in the lobby of the ROM. In this spectacle, Ms. Chief calls Ushen Delacroix, Paul Kane, and George Catlin for, uh, from the dead and come to speak to with her. She assumes a previous mod modeling relationship with all three painters and by taking on the role of interviewer, Ms. Chief employs the strategy of, quote, what's called reverse anthropology. When she summons the men in Cree to join her, each man clearly recognizes Ms. Chief and recalls a shared history with her. In this moment, Mugman demonstrates that indigenous people have been on this land since time immemorial. Ms. Chief herself also reminisces as she tells the audience how she, she met Delacroix while touring in the, and performing for Catlin and further explains, quote, I had the greatest pleasure of modeling, modeling for him privately in a studio in Paris. He drew numerous sketches of me, both nude and in my full regalia. Later, Catlin incorporated these studies into his famous painting, The Nanchez, as an ode to, quote, the dying race, end quote. In this short introduction, Monkman, Miss Chief, unearths the sexualization, exotization, and commodification of indigenous people by both Delacroix and, Cat and Catlin. Canadian painter Paul Kane, the character on stage, echoes Delacroix about the vanishing Indian fable. When Miss Chief interviews him, Kane shares, quote, the face of the Redman is no longer seen. All traces of his footsteps are, on, are fast being obliterated. To seek to study their native manners and customs, one must travel far through the pathless forest to find them. Miss Chief confronts this fallacy. Oh, that's just not true. We're here, we're everywhere. We're right here and we always have been. Paul Kane repeats again that the red man is no longer can be seen. Through repeating himself, Kane has convinced himself of his historical validity or perhaps Kane is keenly aware that he profits from the image of the quote-unquote wild Indian who's disappearing. These themes of exotization, commodification, along with rarefication of the savage quote, savage slash authentic Indian reappears with mischief interviewing Catlin. Catlin describes his idea of a national park where the buffalo roam and quote, the native Indian in his classic attire galloping his wild horses a beautiful and thrilling specimen for America to preserve. Miss Chief responds, oh, this is a brilliant idea. Do you mean like a Jurassic Park for Indians? Catlin answers with an eager yes. In fact, he wishes this national park as a monument to his, life work, his life's work. Two-spirit Miss Chief easily exposes the Eurocentric and egocentric underpinnings of Catlin along with other painters. At the same time, she knows that the end, um, that the Jurassic Park ends with the destruction of the museum, with the T-Rex knocking over the banner when the dinosaurs ruled the earth. Miss Chief seems to delight in a similar ending as, Catlin, as Catlin's Jurassic Park for the Indians in which the indigenous people destroy this white Indian museum and take back the land they once fully governed. Monkman also unpacks the Eurocentric pre, um, representation and misrepresentation and fabrication of, of an indigenous spiritual ceremony created through Kane and Catlin's painting. She first questions Kane about his painting, Medicine Mask Dance, that is on display 
at the Institute of Contemporary Culture in the Royal Ontario Museum. According to McIntosh, me medicine, das medicine mask dance, quote, is one of Kane's most reproduced paintings, despite that Kane actually acknowledges it was a work of fantasy. In his conversation with Mischief, Kane describes the regalia worn and how the eight men shook rattles and sang a humming type of song which had no words. Mischief questions Kane. Paul Kane, is that a true story? Are you familiar with my people, the Swampy Crees, originally from the Norway house? In this moment, a Cree performer directly confronts the fallacies and failings of Paul Kane's work and how the Royal Ontario Museum displays his work as, quote, accurate representations of Aboriginal peoples. In this, in this sense, the repertoire, Monkman's performance, directly confronts the archive, white male painters, scholars, and curators. Diana Taylor argues that the repertoire performance has historically been viewed as less valid than the archive, paintings, written documents, etc. Her contention is that the repertoire is important and valid part of history. Through the repertoire, Monkman begins to identify serious cracks in the foundation of the construction of the quote unquote, the authentic and accurate historic, historical archives. While also creating doubt about the, also creating doubt in the audience about all historical accounts created by white supremacist colonizers still occupying indigenous lands. Why would, a muse, why would museum curators and uh, bestow more authority to white historians, I'm going to put historian in quotes, ethnographers, painters about Cree people than by the Cree people themselves. Kane continues to share, to share his, his quote historical accounts and dubiously claims that there was cannibalism among the swampy Crees. Miss Chief laughs and tells him, oh, this is really great stuff, Mr. Kane. All right, I'm sure the audience would be thrilled to hear more about your true stories. Through this interview, the creation of the, quote, the exotic and savage Indian, end quote, is exposed and debunked by the knowledgeable and sassy Miss Chief. Miss Chief also questions George Catlin about his paintings of indigenous ceremony, the dance of the bird ash. Once again, Monkman uses Catlin, Catlin's own words to describe his quote unquote, historical writings. Catlin describes a man dressed in woman's clothing who is, quote, driven to the most servile and degrading duties, he being the only one in his tribe submitting to this disgraceful um, degradation, is looked upon as a medicine and sacred, and a feast is given to him annually. Through a European heteropatriarchal lens, Cain views quote unquote, a man wearing quote unquote, women's clothing and assuming, a uh, and assuming a traditional woman's role as degrading. In indigenous matrilineal systems, this of course would not be the case. Also becoming a medicine person is a long spiritual path that holds much responsibility and importance in indigenous communities. Catlin's further claims that quote, the Burdash practice as an oddity and an exception within Indian country and that the fact admits that he wants it not to exist, end quote. I should, wish, I should wish that it might be extinguished before it's more fully recorded. Monkman reveals a historian ethnographer painter who, who only records what, deem, what he deems appropriate and worthwhile for the future generations to know, creating a distorted image and a premeditated erasure of two spirit peoples. Catlin is part of the colonial and post project that aims to regulate or eliminate indigenous people's bodies, particularly those that least fit into the heteropatriarchal binary and hierarchy. Through Ms. Chief's Monkman's begins to map the archive of the erasure of two-spirit people and the traditions tied to those roles. Monkman goes a step further by telling Kane Quote, us bows, dandies, and faint, heart, and faint hearts are still here. You, you have now also failed to, failed to extinguish the dance of the bird ash, as we're about to bring it back more uncomfortable and more disgusting than ever. Miss Chief gives Catlin two choices. Um, 
sorry, I just lost my spot. <laughs> um, she gives, uh, Miss Chief gives Catelyn two choices. Mr. Catelyn, you may now return from where you came or you may stay to join us because it's time to dance to Miss Chief. It's time, it's time. A group of men, dancers join in Miss Chief on the stage to create a reinterpreted modern live of the dance of the bird ash. Ultimately, the repertoire of Munkman's performance subverts the archive of Catlin's paintings and seance as the audience joins in the dance to celebrate with Miss Chief Munkman in her unabashed reclam reclamation of two-spirit people. Munkman's work ripples out beyond the performance and, quote, posits a memory that forever alters the bearer of the memory and imposes a responsibility to its remembrance and its, uh, and its reality, end quote. Munkman's stories also brings queer indigenous perspectives to light, written, written, wherein two-spirit people fight against colonization and claim their rightful place in history. It is through his artwork and present that Miss Chief that conquers history, a mischief's present of that conquers history begins to crack, fade, and be exposed for the fallacies while being replaced by a more complex and inclusive indigenous story history. So from here, we're going to shift to Jake uh, reading another piece that's connected to what Monkman created. And uh, again, this is from Paul Kane's uh, diaries, which become these primary sources, which become like. He's an authority in his, as a historian. And so what um, Muckman's doing here is he's flipping and he's using Kane's words, but he's now talking about Europeans. And that's what Jake will be reading an oh, excerpt of that right now. Thanks, Jake. Good evening, everyone. Good early evening. Uh, disclaimer, my internet sucks. So we'll see what happens. Um, it goes like this. Upon my arrival here from the continent of North America, where I've already passed considerable time in studying the customs and manners of the European male, I have determined to devote whatever talents and proficiency I possess to the painting of a series of pictures illustrative of the European male in his native habitat. Let me just let's go again. But alas, in North America, the face of the white man is changing. All traces of his former self are being altered through contact with the red man. And those who wish to study this, the splendor of the European male in his original state must travel far and wide to find him. <laughs> um, sorry, my bad. Thus, it has become my undertaking to record all manner of his customs and practices before they are obliterated completely. As I trust that my pictures will possess not only an interest for the curious, but also an, an intrinsic value to the historian. And so I have set forth on this arduous and perilous undertaking with the determination of reaching every tribe of Europe and of creating faithful portraits of their handsomest personages, views of their villages, ceremonies, and their sport, etc. I have the opportunity of the free use of nature's undisguised models from which to draw fair conclusions in the sciences of physiognomy, physi, physio, no, I don't know how to say that word, physiognomy, I want to say that, and phrenology, with full notes on their character, history, and of course, their anatomy. Um, um, the, Eng the English are of fine physique and their facial characteristics are represented by the semi on feeling for his dignity and individuality, man, in the simplicity and loftiness of his nature, unrestrained and unfettered by the disguises of art, is surely the most, the, is surely the most beautiful model for the painter. The European male in North America is an honest, 
hospitable, brave, warlike, cruel, revengeful, relentless, yet honorable, contemplative, and religious being. Thus, it has become my undertaking. Oh, wait, no, I think I already said this page, right? Yeah, I already said this page. My bad, everybody. I think I'm done. Am I done? <laughs> I think I read it all. I'm not sure. My, uh, I'm not worried. Thank I did it all? Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Great. I think we're um, moving towards questions, Selena. I think you're doing that now. Um, or, yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, thanks for that. Um, both of you, Jean and, and Jake. Um, and I guess what's going to happen now is uh, I have a, I have a, a number of questions, um, partly coming from, particularly coming from the field of performance. Um, as, as my research field and I share with Jean, we are faculty members in, in the drama department. And I have to say, although we're faculty members uh, and we talk all the time, sometimes at great length, uh, rarely do I get a chance to really to really hear Jean expansively explain some of her research. So I really appreciate the opportunity that's presented by this feminist speaker series uh, for us to talk together. Um, so uh, I guess I'm, I'm struck by the, the small video you shared at the beginning, Jean. Mm -hmm. And uh, I noticed one of the quotes that Monkman said um, is that he's created uh, mischief as an alter ego to live within his art. And so, and you showed some of the images that uh, mischief uh, is painted in uh, the visual art form that Monkman practices um, and with great, you know, mastery. Um, and yet with the seance, uh, um, we have mischief embodied. And I think that that's a, uh, in terms of performance, I think it's quite fascinating that this is a character that Monkman originally created for his visual art practice, but then eventually, um, stirred by some other impulse, has actually that started to embody the character of mischief. So could you speak a bit about the significance of the embodiment of mischief? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, like I was saying in there, if you just have a painting, that can come and go, but when you actually have a, per a creep person right there <laughs> questioning all that's right inside, for instance, the ROM, which is, you know, a very big and important museum, right? And um, not, only in, not only in Toronto, but in, in Canada, right? And these, these painters are quite well known too. So I think it's a, I would say it's a big leap for Kent Monkman as he's more, uh, when I, I've met him only once at imag um, Imagination, um, remembering them correctly, uh, but he seemed very shy, right, and kind of a quiet person, and usually painters are, you know, painting by themselves, particularly when they're um, new at it. So, and I think, uh, yeah, using the drag queen, kind of using that persona, like, um, and again, using in painting, but then actually coming out, right, in a way, in a very big way, coming into spaces as a two-spirit person, but also in drag, right, and so, um, showing that kind of complexity around relationship to uh, to gender, and um, and kind of taking on a very uh, well what he would call also a trickster kind of character, right? Like really big and coming forward and not letting anyone get off the hook in a way. Which is uh, there's a fierceness that comes with drag queens, right? And like that's part of um, usually part of what comes out through that. So I think for someone who's uh, tends to be a little quieter and shyer and more internal and in doing these paintings to come out seems like seems like it was a big act of of his right and that he continues to do it so but they, i think that it's harder to um walk away or not be impacted when it's embodied right and that there's people in the, that audience right who are also embodying that experience so that i think around performance studies is really really important right like this is in the moment it is uh there's a connection um you can it's it's easier to walk past a painting right <laughs> like you get to be like oh that's kind of interesting i don't even remember if i read the title right they often have these big things on the side that maybe we don't really want to spend the time reading mm -hmm. but you can't really easily walk away 
with Monkman calling out these these historians, quote unquote, uh, painters, right? And to to uh, to really uh, speak to it in a very fierce way, and in this in this persona that allows, which I'm I'm also interested in dragging that way. What does it allow? And I think it allows that it allows uh, people to express something maybe they normally wouldn't or didn't feel confident enough to say, or again, um, yeah, just that, that, that it, I, I've, I've, it's been interesting to look at how drag can do that and how performance can allow a different way of seeing and talking and embodying. And in this case, as somebody who could be very shy to very, very body in a way, right, in a way. Yeah, I don't know if that answers what you were asking. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's, I'm maybe hoping, I know that you also are, have a great deal of knowledge about drag performance history. So hopefully we can go, maybe go into that even a bit more at some point. But I mean, I'm struck by um, particularly your explanation of this particular performance of seance mm -hmm. and uh, it being a, a response, Monkman's decision to respond to the, the museum's refusal to allow his art uh, to respond. And that, that embodied presence in the lobby is a really power, powerful, like a very powerful response for mischief. If mischief is an alter ego who lives in his paintings, mm -hmm. and yet his paintings are not being allowed to be presented, that mischief has to step out yeah. in, that, in that moment, right? Um, is it, was, so was Seance one of the first live performances of mischief, or had he done it before in other places? I think that's the first, from my understanding of knowing his work, because, you know, a lot of his work isn't necessarily even on his web page. I'll put that out, having gone through archives in, um, at York University, like there's stuff you get, you know, different accesses. But yeah, I would say it was early on in that coming out, for sure. And that this was one that was very specifically directed at, like, you will not censor me, you will not take, I will not let you have this evening without an Indigenous painter in this whole thing, right? <laughs> like I'm being invited and then you're basically um, telling me I can't, right? Like only if you do it our way, right? Which is not an indigenous way. Um, and it erases indigenous ways of knowing and seeing and being. And so, um, so it was very, it was very political, right? To like literally just show up and uh, create, a, create a great scene moment, right? Where uh, it was, you know, stops everyone <laughs> they might not even get into the gallery to see what you know <laughs> these other painters did but now they're going to look at them differently when they do come back right mm -hmm. so there's you, it, i think there's something about that as a it really was an act of, you know an act to um as a response that needed to be there so yeah he he has done he had done some stuff in england for sure before that too, and um, and then he's filmed some of his stuff too. So that's that can it's not quite the same, but again, it's different than just a painting. So yeah, I would say that's happened. That was one of the earliest and the one that I know specifically about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's a. Um, it's very, I mean, it's so striking, uh, and the, the form of the performance and his you know his calling up the the. The dead white men who have who are given such authority by the by the institution, and dismantling their authority with his with his presence, right? Mm -hmm. And that I think is a, a real key to to live performance is that it takes place in the present tense. That mm -hmm. you know, it it is all it, um, and particularly for the tiresome, <laughs> ongoing uh, ideas that are you know continue to circulate in places like museums that indigenous people are vanished and of the past mm -hmm. um, that to have his body there in this in this role in the present tense and interacting is like it just emphasizes the point he's making even more right and the like the form is actually really really supporting his con the content of what he's trying to, to convey um i mean do you want to speak a little bit i mean i think that maybe the that uh, that fierceness and the um the the response to censorship and the like like uh the push to be to be present could you speak to that in terms of the wider history of drag performance that um <laughs> see, that last, see that last moment of what you just said oh okay. just that it, um could you uh could you speak a bit to monkman's uh his his decision to perform at this moment in uh this character uh as a kind of a fierceness and a response to being censored 
Could you speak about that in relation to a longer history of drag performance? Yeah, yeah. So if we go back, um, and again, how far do we go back? Mm -hmm. Whose stories are told? But we know that um, those who generally, when we look at some of the origins of drag, um, there's a film we watched in my class called Screaming Queens, where it's like, um trans women and gay men who want to dress up in what's considered women's clothes i mean we need to go again we need to get out of the idea of women and men's clothes and, we, and have our stores not be so binary still but but this this desire to 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 feel this way and look this way of uh, this part of whatever you know that means whether it's being um, a connection to a, a a feminine kind of you know way of thinking or really wanting to uh, be seen as a woman right and whatever that's like it's a spectrum right um or to be beautiful right <laughs> um is another thing um uh, that again um that that's not always the case right that that a lot of people of color are not told they're beautiful a lot of people who have whose bodies don't fit the image of woman or man and the ways uh, that it's been created can feel not so beautiful right so it's it's the sense of being um liberated hopefully right like um, and yet, at the same time, there were law, there were laws um, against that, right? So just having lipstick on, and uh, and and you were read as someone who was a man, even if you didn't identify that way, you could just go to jail, right? So this is really, um, and there was you know an uprising, you know, in in Compton, in in San Francisco before Stonewall, and there was uprisings here too, right? Like everywhere, um, it's just not always documented or known. So it's so um, it has a history of resistance. It has a history of taking a risk uh, on your life, even to just get to express who you are or parts of who you are, and it's it's a powerful history really and an exciting one and there and we're we're not out of there yet right it's like we're still not there um i you know i've certainly been called names <laughs> um, since i've been in edmonton which is really different from where i've lived previously and certainly been called you know it and all these weird things that uh, come out of people because they've been given only one side of the story and only giving um that you know we're deviant with blah 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 all these groups of people and so two spirit even more so because you're already there's already this um, incredible terrible uh, dominant narrative that already makes indigenous people less than human or as as you know as it we've already heard right and then on top of that if you're two spirit um, also becomes another level of oh my gosh you know I don't even you know um, and and yeah like just we don't and i'm not even sure what the numbers are around you know both violence and the suicide within the two-spirit community because there's so many ways that harm comes when you're further and further outside of the colonial project right um so so drag has a long history of resistance and and risk and um fierceness just to say no more no more yeah thank you thank you that that uh that gives a, a sense even uh, more of the complexity of this of this performance that he did with Seance, but has continued to do in, in various places whenever whenever he deems it necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that was I mean, that was my my final question before we open it up to a larger Q and A from the audience. So that's a there is a Q and A feature um, that you could uh, find at the bottom of your screen. And if you click on that. I believe it'll allow you to ask a question and I'm I will moderate the questions and you know figure out you know if people are asking similar ones try and compile those and uh, and present them to Jean so you can certainly at this point if you have a questions that you're thinking of um, please feel free to put them in the Q&A or I guess if you can't access the Q&A don't know how to do that you could put them into the chat which uh, all of our, the panelists can see it um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll manage them if they start flowing through <laughs> at a really fast rate because there's almost a hundred people here. Um, and I guess that was the, so the final question I want you already sort of touched on it a little bit, Jean, was just thinking about the stakes of this performance uh, for Monkman himself, um, but also the, the material consequences of a two-spirit and gay man's performance circulating so widely, and particularly in, a, in a, an absolute mastery of an, of, uh, like his his uh, his chosen art form in visual arts, but also in the actual form of performance as well. 
um, and how that um, might uh, might be able to you know affect the lived experiences of two-spirit people across across two turtle island yeah i think there's um you know for me um when i came in to do my um phd in at york university my original focus was actually drag <laughs> you know like i was interested in like what can drag do um and then i it was the first it was the opening of wawate's play agukwe um and it's based on his true story where there's also stuff mixed in um that's not what happened um but one of the things that was true first of all he's an incredible performer and very generous um performer and um really just and i felt like the whole audience was changed in a way um and yeah so but in that later i got to talk with him um shoot i just lost <laughs> my screen sorry um i talked with him and um yeah it, it was a, it was a, it was based on a true story of his first um partner um committing suicide two weeks before i mean two days before he arrived at um his partner's reserve and this was before there was any um cell phones yeah sorry i'm trying to get back to the screen somehow <laughs> failing uh yeah, so um, I'll just keep talking. So anyway, I, I, I got interested in like what other plays are there, two-spirit plays, and like put on a native serve and a native theater serve, and then talk to my friends who were indigenous and those who were two-spirited. And um, it was really actually hard to find two-spirit plays. Um, and I only was able to find uh, four at that time, and it's still lacking. So. So if, if you don't see your life reflected back ever, whether it's through films, whether it's through paintings, whether it's through um, plays, whatever, if there, that erasure really makes you, uh, can cause someone to feel really alone and feel like there's, um, I don't know, like you're the only one out there. If there's no, nothing coming back at you, that it can impact you quite largely, particularly when you are younger. Um, so I think Monkman's work, along with all, all the other Two-Spirit artists, um, really start to shift that and it's important, it's like it's, um, it's life-saving potentially, right? And so I think that's, that's the power of this work and why it's important and um, why what Mike Kent Monkman has done is has been risky, I'm sure, at the very beginning. Um, now he's very, very famous and internationally known, and so and he's older, right? So it's a different um, situation. But to to constantly have images everywhere now in museums of two spirit people is really amazing. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out how to get out of here. <laughs> Sorry, that was my um, my uh, computer going off. Um, so uh, we have some questions coming in. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think um, uh, not just with Monkman, but with other other uh, two spirit performers like Wawate um, mm -hmm. and others that you that you anthologized in your in your book, um, mm -hmm. you, where you did the work of uh, in an interesting kind of way as you're as you're arguing about the importance of the repertoire and live performance, but you also did the work of creating uh, a document that could that could travel in other ways as well in order mm -hmm. to kind of uh, widen the impact um, so and, and be incorporated into our theater history right yeah. um, was also why we need plays um, that are written down too yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a couple of people asking for um, some information um, mm -hmm. one is just uh, whether do you know if there would uh, was there did the, did Rom respond formally after Monkman did this performance? Was there an apology? Was there, um, you know, are his paintings now in the museum? All those those sort of what actions might have come since that time? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know. I don't think there was an apology right after if there was one at all. Um, I know that I've seen some of. Um, 
some paintings that Monkman has actually done, regardless of whether it got into the museum or not. Originally, I'm not sure if it's in the ROM, but he definitely takes Paul Kane paintings and indigenizes and queers them and brings, you know, mischief is in it. So certainly uh, Monkman had went forward some way or another. Um, I'm not 100% sure it's in the ROM per se, <laughs> but um, I definitely know that he went forward and was able to get his artwork out. And again, if you go on his website, sometimes you can't find that stuff anymore um, because he's, he's just t uh, produced so much work. I think he, he um, picks and chooses what's on his website or what's more um, work that's happening now. Yeah. yeah. So the, um, I mean, I think you said, uh, you told me earlier that his museum's now in the, in MoMA and or his, his, his work is now in MoMA and he's being recognized as like, um, widely internationally now in yeah. the mastery of painting. So he's, um, you know, but the, uh, whatever, the, uh, the people in the gatekeepers at ROM at the time, <laughs> um, perhaps uh, in, in retrospect could, could recognize, even if they didn't at the time recognize their, their mistakes, although they did inspire, it sounds like a pretty amazing performance. Yeah. Um, so another, another question, um, is I guess thinking a, a little bit about um, this is a very um, uh, performance art and uh, you know coming from like the field of visual arts that are you know trying to take apart the kind of static nature of visual art gallery mm -hmm. um, and performance artists um, you know there's also a very long history of performance art it is related to the practice of theater but also sometimes uh, there are distinct uh, differences, one of which is the solo nature of, of performance art, mm -hmm. uh, which you've already spoken to a bit and how that obviously, like it makes a lot of sense that this is an alter ego that was from within his paintings that he, that he then, um, you know, used a different medium to create, to create a live version of this alter ego. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the, one of the attendants is asking, um, could um, mischief testicle uh, become a play? A performance like a, what we think of as a play not as a performance not, not as a performance art piece can you imagine something like that or, or do you know of anything that is all that already exists not to, not necessarily of monkman's but of others like that um yeah it, i i think it would i don't know there's something about the live in the moment there that, um and for who who monkman is like again mostly a painter and um obviously sculptor all those things I think it's plausible, um, it, yeah, but there's actually is a play that's in process of being um, published. It's, again, it's still hard to find Two-Spirit Place, so if you all know some, <laughs> you know, it's, I'm uh, happy to keep getting them to publishers or whatever, be part of that process, or you can too, right? But there's one that's called Where the Spirit Lies, um, that's by Marshall, and I can't think of his last name at the moment, but this I also gave to my um, students in my drag course, because we have to look at um, two-spirit and gender and sexuality when we talk about um, drag in general. Um, and, and it is actually exactly that. It's, it's a drag queen um, basically telling her story, right? Or his story, whatever, their story. Um, so using drag as a way to talk about um, all the challenges and beautiful parts of uh, about being two spirit. So, so there is one that's coming out, I believe, soon-ish. Um, but that's what it's called, and it's uh, an anthology that's con um, connected to Calgary area. Um, and so, yeah, that so there is one that kind of does that, which I think is as neat. What's all are interesting because it also in there is like Wawate's play too. There's there's um, indigenous knowledges and um, information that ha often hasn't necessarily been passed down to the, new, the next generation of Two-Spirit folks. So it, again, gives an opportunity to have more um, information of what, what might have been there happen. Um, so, so yeah, so there is a play that does kind of, kind of do that, I would say, um, versus Monkman isn't necessarily taking on his personal life in in the piece in these pieces. He, he's constantly, constantly uh, coming after the colonial project. Um, yeah, but I think it's always possible <laughs> for sure. Sure. Um, I have a couple other questions. Yeah. Um, 
and I guess continuing on the just on the the concept and the history of drag of drag and drag queens, mm -hmm. uh, somebody's wondering, does Monkman uh, himself use the term drag queen when when uh, referring to Miss Chief, or is that something that that uh, in the reception of the character that's been uh, categorized as such, is that how we are classifying it? Is that or is it something that Monkman Monkman himself would uh, discuss in that way? Yeah, so no, I, he would not, like I've never seen him write it or say it, um, that he's a drag queen or that that's a drag queen. He talks about mischief as a trickster and alter ego for sure. He also identifies as two-spirit and as gay and not seeing the two as the same and conflated. So yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's, that's me certainly putting that there as someone who's teaching about drag because, and, and it, and the um, the form he's using falls into that for sure. Um, but yes, <laughs> he, he, I, I mostly have heard alter ego and trickster as the way he describes mischief for sure. Um, yeah, I think the the um, attendees saying that seems like mischief is meant to avoid uh, avoid identity categories and classifications. Um, as part of as part of that sort of fierce resistance. Yeah, I could hear that for sure. Yep. Um, another question about, uh, I guess, about the performance is, uh, do you know whether or not Monkman creates the costume himself, or is that does he collaborate with somebody else uh, to build that? I don't know. I'd imagine he could do it because he's, you know, he's such a, a hands-on person and creating so much incredible um, work that's three-dimensional, right? That goes beyond painting. I know that when he originally started, um, Mischief was really based on Cher um, and like literally copied kind of her image of uh, being indigenous, although that's a dubious claim, um, <laughs> or that's what's been said about Cher. Um, and so I think he was interested in that, which is also a big icon in the white gay male culture is is Cher, is, is one of those um, singers. So I think that's interesting to think about um, his first kind of ways of coming into this creation of Mischief was uh, about around Cher. And I, when I went to this, a bunch of films, um, oh, which um, Kent Monkman was, had some of his films on there, they're actually great. If you, you can get, we don't have them at U of A, I've asked, I've asked for them now. Um, but again, we're in this change of struggle around um, sources and the course of sources. But um, there's quite a few great films where Miss Chief is in there. And, um, and when I was there at this, uh, so this film festival, um, there was one uh, singing that song, um, Half Breed and having Cher singing it and um, kind of looking at, uh, again, a persona that was part, that was very much impacted or created based on how she looked and so forth. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's what I can say about that process, if that makes sense. I don't, I don't know specifically um, how the costumes were made, but I know where it began. Yeah, if that makes sense. Um, still a couple more questions. We have, I guess, about 10 more minutes mm -hmm. before we need to start wrapping up. Um, so uh, one question here that has to do with um, if we're doing, going to try and think outside of um, you know the kind of Western traditions of performance art as they have developed in the last you know last part of the 20th century, mm -hmm. um, and then also outside of the history of drag, um, uh, someone's wondering whether there is a tradition of um, an indigenous performance or creative activity that uh, might relate to this. I know that you mentioned that um, Monkman, like he, like he ends seance with like a, an invitation to the dance of the Berdash. Mm -hmm. um, and possibly not everybody understands the, the, the uh, what that dance would have been in a, or even the, the concept of a Berdash. So that might be useful mm -hmm. to speak a little bit about. Yeah, I, I mean, Burdash um, for most two spirit people is, is a well, it's a French word and it's not, it, it's, it seems derogatory based upon what I've read and what people have said, and including Monkman. Um, he's reclaiming it and reusing it as a positive thing, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's definitely 
that's definitely how it's framed at the beginning. This is how um, two-spirit people were called, right? Not that they were asked, because there are specific names like Wawate, um, the play Agukwe is within the man, there's a woman, and that's a um, Anishinaabe word, right? So the bird ash is, is really um, the French version, of their perspective on a two-spirit person, right? Um, versus what people would actually call themselves or name themselves. And then there's certain folks who are two-spirit that um, there's maybe even a question of like, well, was that even a word or needed um, um, within that particular nation? In other words, um, you know, who you are and how you are in your community and your path and all that is more important. Um, and that uh, these categories of gender and sexuality just weren't, um, weren't necessarily there or being named as something separate to all of who you are in your spiritual path. So, so I think um, the dance of the bird ash is definitely an idea where we, again, and, and some kind of see, seeing something, um, some ceremony, you know, Paul Kane in this case, right? Seeing it and then interpreting that through painting about it and writing about it, which is, you know, what you heard earlier. So I think it's really tricky when it comes to how, uh, how to translate from uh, European ways of thinking and non non indigenous ways of thinking and creation. So I would say that um, I think that well, each nation has their own own ceremonies and they're very specific to the land and language and community. Um, so I don't know what that would mean per nation for somebody who's um, does have a name like. A gukwe and like what what that would mean in a ceremony. Um, I think that would differentiate or be different in different nations is my sense. Um, and I'm happy if somebody wants to add to that. I think that um, what I like because I part certainly part of my research has a lot to do with indigenous languages and the knowledges and worldviews that are held within them. And I think it's work that's ongoing um, across like as part of indigenous resurgence all, all over the world really to that to uh, return to the languages and find those words like agakwe um, or words in Maori and words that actually describe a, a different way of being in the world than this gen like a binary gender and and you know it's difficult work languages are um, were under assault as part of the colonial project and so um, but the, uh, it's quite um, uh, it's quite also quite inspiring when uh, can find those sort of things like a gokwe within a man there is a woman or the other way around is like a you know a very interesting way of thinking about it that can help you think differently mm -hmm. um so uh still have a few more minutes um let's see um i guess um hello. someone's asking you to plug your work a little bit like you mentioned this is from a a, a longer paper you're reading a short version and mm -hmm. um the person's asking where might they find the longer a longer version of the work? Um, well, it's shorter. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I th my, basically it's related to a transcript, but also, which is in the book that I put together, but it's also based on the film of, the, of this piece. So it's coming from that, um, not just from written, if that makes sense. Um, and then, of course, um, there's multiple Indigenous uh, scholars in there that I'm pulling from, too. So I'm happy to share any of that and um, send that out. Um, but yeah, this is, I, my, when I was originally writing this, I also looked at other performances that Monkman had done as Miss Chief that I was able to access. Um, again, access to per live performance is very, very different um, than the paintings and the sculptures. And I've actually been in the ROM and got to see some of Muffin's uh, sculpture work. And uh, yeah, so yeah, happy to, to pass that along. We also have a note from a, a participant that uh, they've, they've put a link, I don't know if I can broadcast it to everybody, but I guess you could Google it, that uh, the, the ROM is working with Muffin again in an upcoming exhibit, so. Perhaps mm -hmm. they will uh, do some restitution of some sort to do it <laughs> for the earlier, yeah. if they haven't already. Um, yeah, that was a, a while ago, so it's, uh, it's good to see the Ramas 
you know, was probably already shifting it before that, but even more so, which is great. Sure. But I guess then, and uh, another question that's come up here is, uh, I'll be asking uh, kind of a combination of to you and also to Jake, um, mm -hmm. thinking about in your presentation, um, not only were, were you, uh, you know, you showed us a video of Monkman speaking himself about his work, um, you explained the, uh, your, your research uh, paper you, that you uh, linked to larger, a larger field of uh, performance studies. Mm -hmm. And then you also um, asked Jake to come and read uh, a piece that Monkman wrote. And so just a, a curiosity about, um, I guess, two things. And Jake, if you want to respond, this is an invitation to you too. Um, you know, why was it important to have those words spoken uh, aloud and why, um, what did it feel like to, to speak Monkman's words? Just a, a, a opening up for comment for that, if you like. Do you want to start, Jake, or would you like me to talk? Uh, you can, you can start. Um, in the best possible world, um, Jake and I would have time for to work together through the whole research paper and really have um, Jake speaking versus me because I'm not um, indigenous, I'm not um, a man, and, I'm, um, and I don't walk the shoes of, of a gay man either. Like those are all it's very different, even if we're all lumped into a community. Um, so yeah, so for me, um, I was trying to connect with uh, the fierceness that was there, yeah, in, in Monkman's performance and the sense of humor that he had in there too. I don't know if I always succeeded with that, but uh, you know, he's just, uh, he's like, oh my, you know, he's just making fun of these guys in, in a great way, in my opinion. Um, so, so for me, it was um, a challenge, but also um, I, I want, like, it's important to hear what he did, right? And like the, and to have an example of these resistance um, and education really, yeah. I'll leave it to you, Jake. Uh, to be honest, I did not read the stuff beforehand, so it was kind of sh shocking to me. I was like, oh, wow, I should have prepared. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I don't know. It was, it was pretty wild, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is my first uh, lecture, so I'm not that good at answering questions. But, uh, yeah, that's... Did it... Is it, uh, had you read anything like that before where somebody flipped the, that idea of anthropology? I guess they're studying white people instead of, and using the actual words, you know, or is that, because uh, it's very, it's very funny to hear it. Mm hmm yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no, Kent Monkman was the only one who, uh, who I've experienced with that stuff. I've, I, right. I, I, heard, I heard about this play a little while back, but yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks. No, um, not, of course. <laughs> um, so uh, going back to the, the questions in the Q&A, uh, someone's asking for more recommendations for reading up on history or connections of drag and two-spirit people. Um, I think that there's not a lot of that combination, but there's a lot of great um, queer, so, so queer indigenous studies kind of came out in 2011. So those two um, disciplines, not that they weren't talking to each other, but they weren't often talking to each other. And um, it came out right as I was in the process of writing my dissertation, because I was gonna be like, how do I bring these two together? Um, not that they're op opposite of each other, but often they get siloed, even where I worked in a department where it was critical race, gender, and sexuality, and I was on a floor that was with languages and indigenous studies, or native studies, it's called, and what I noticed was that we were supposed to talk about the construction of race, um, but nobody was, but indigenous people were not in that part of the department, right? Like we, it was, it was but there's, there is a construction of race around and just people, the imaginary Indian, I think as Francis calls it. Um, and then within the, in the native studies that there was no two spirit stuff in there, right? It, it, and it was only when there was a two spirit sessional um, who had never read anything of that combined those two um, was 
we started having a conversation. I'm like, hey, here's a book, you know, if you want to check it out and you want to incorporate it. And then you could see both sides starting to incorporate, right? Which was really exciting to be part of that, right? To um, have all these scholars that have done such great work looking at um, queer studies and indigenous studies together. Um, so I'm happy to send those forward, um, make a list. Um, I brought it, I made the list for other folks and um, it's, it's really, I think, um, pretty amazing. And I'll keep looking for the combination of drag um, and, um, and performance. Because again, a lot of time drag isn't, it's, it's ephemeral, it goes away, right? Most times it's not filmed. Um, and, there, and there are two spirit people that are in that. Um, I know for Fruit Loops, that's a local group here in Edmonton. This year they had to film, you know, they pride didn't happen, blah, blah, blah. And so they filmed a drag show and they had a stage and, and then they had little uh, interviews with people and there was one two spirit person who was doing drag. Um, so I think uh, in general, I would say drag is not considered maybe a very important topic to write about or talk about in the world of research. I'm not saying totally, but it's, it's just something, it's again, we consider it often we, not me and you and I, but that's considered a low art and it's not part of theater history or performance studies. Um, so I think there's a lot less period written about it, um, never mind, um, you know, specific groups within that. Um, yeah, although there's a, this is not indigenous, but there's a, a great book coming out around the first um, black drag queen um, who was a, who had been formerly enslaved. And so this, uh, this um, historian has put together a whole book of like how the drag ball scene began and what's now called the United States. So I think it's complicated to find archival information. It's complicated when it's performance and generally is not recorded and it never quite translates, right? When we record something live. So it's, that's the dance with all of this work, I think. I also think um, in the field of, of theater history and theater perf and performance, um, it's actually pretty notable, and particularly thinking about indigenous performance, the, the unremarked on uh, part of the history that many of the first uh, professional indigenous theater artists in Canada were themselves queer or two-spirit. And that's not generally part of the, the history as it's been presented, mm -hmm. but actually, I, you know, as um, in my talks with you over, <laughs> over the time, I've started, I've started to understand that much more important that, that uh, you know, the fierceness and the, the, uh, the courage that uh, it takes to live as a queer person in, the, in this world can translate into other like you know, remarkable risks and, uh, and uh, decisions to push, to push forward for equity and justice in, yeah. in many places, including and I, in theater. Yeah. <laughs> and I just want to really give props to and deep appreciation from Muriel Miguel because um, she's amazing and she was, um, <laughs> she uh, it was amazing to get to uh, work with her and bring a play that had been written in the 90s but like back so that it could be uh, seen or read or performed and uh, just uh, she was at a time where it wasn't safe you know and the, and um, you know this meeting in San Francisco she was one of those people that was there um, and yeah, so, and, it, and, and there was a huge age crisis going on, right? Another pandemic that we don't necessarily call a pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, she's, she's still doing it. She's an incredible theater artist. And, and Wawate saw the possibility of being a theater artist when she came to his reserve and did a play, an indigenous play. And all of a sudden it was like, oh, that exists. <laughs> There's a place for me to, to go and, do theater and study theater and create stories that are indigenous centered um so so it's all connected right it's um it's all connected as we know yeah right. um so i think we're close to the end of time and i'm going to pass it back over to michelle uh, but i just want to you know express my appreciation for the chance to listen to listen to your work and thank you jake for for reading monkman's words it was great to hear them out of your out of with your voice um and to all the participants who've who've been posing these great questions to, that led to this, this conversation so.
Thank you. Thanks, Selena, too, and everybody else who I can't see. <laughs> Thanks. I'm just going to take a couple of moments um, with some closing words. I'll just reiterate the thank you to Jake, Jean, and to Selena as well for um, this really great conversation about Monkman and Monkman's work. I also want to send a thank you to Rachel Zukuski and Betty Lee, as well as Susanna Luman, all from the Intersections of Gender group. They, they did a lot of work bringing this, attempt, this event together. Um, a recording, you might have noticed there's a little recording button in the, on the top corner of your screen. A recording of this lecture will be made available through the Intersections of Gender website, so you'll be able to uh, watch it again or share it widely. And then I do want to take a moment just to uh, make uh, an announcement and then uh, offer an invitation. And the announcement is, uh, apropos of Monkman, is that there is a talk called A Talk with Kent Monkman scheduled um, on Saturday, September 26th. It's a free Zoom presentation from 11 to noon um, through the MOA, which is the Museum of Anthropology at UBC the University of British Columbia. So that's something if you're interested, and I know we are, we are also interested in this topic, you'll be able to uh, hear um, Kent himself talk about his work. So that's the announcement. And then the invitation is, uh, I'd like to invite you as the chair of the Department of Women's and Gender Studies to our Dallas Cullen Memorial Lecture. Dallas Cullen is a former chair of our department and we have a, a memorial lecture for her in her name every year. This year it's feature, featuring Margaret Morganroth Gallette, who's an American feminist scholar of age and ageism. Her talk is called uh, How Ageism Worsened the Pandemic. So um, you can, you're all welcome to come to that. You can find information um, and a link to uh, register for that event um, on the Women's and Gender Studies webpage. Uh, she has um, provided some books, so she's got a, an ebook. And if you if you'd like to get the ebook in advance of the presentation, um, you can do that through registering. Her book is called How Not to Shoot Old People. But that that talk, the Dallas Cullen Memorial Lecture, is October first at three thirty. So look for that. And um, with that, I, I will end things. And um, this was really a great conversation. Thank you all so much for attending. Goodbye.